Hello everyone, my name is Chin Hui and uh, I would like to talk about how do we design functional data pipelines for reproducibility and maintainability. Okay, so a little bit about myself, I'm Chin Hui, um, I'm a data engineer at DT1, uh, so it's a fintech company, so we did mainly deal with a lot of like, digital, trans digital communication transactions. So I come from a background in aerospace engineering and computational modeling. And also in my day job, I am also a speaker and I occasionally write about data processing. So when we talk about a data pipeline, right? Um, so this, it starts off something simple. We have an input, we have a process or an operation, and then we have an output. So in this case, our operation is whereby we create a circle that fits a particular shape. And so this is six. So we have the extract, the data extract the input, we transform, and then we have the output. So it looks pretty easy, right? Turns out it's, if we were to design a data pipeline at scale, it tends to be a little bit tricky because when we design a data pipeline at scale, we need to consider three things. Firstly, it has to be reliable. What we mean is that data pipeline must produce the desired output, which links us to the issue of reproducibility. It also has to be scalable, which means that the data pipeline must run independently across multiple nodes, which links us to the concept of parallelism. And last but not least, because when we design a data pipeline at scale, we need to expect that there will be changing business logic. So we need to be able to design the data pipeline such that we can extend it without much disruption. And this links us to the topic of maintainability. And one of the challenges when we are designing data pipelines at scale. So let's start off with developing the data pipeline during the testing phase. So typically, we, we, when we develop the, 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 the logic for data pipeline during the testing phase, we need to consider whether we can get reproducible results. So let's take an example of uh, processing uh, and approving loads. So we have our loan request, and if we want to determine whether we want to approve the loans, we will need to look at the customer credit ratings to determine whether the customer is trustworthy. And so we, we, so we have the data source, we have our competition, and what we are achieving, what we are trying to achieve is the target, which is the approved loads. And when, when, we when, we, when we design the data pipeline, we need to ensure that with the same data source, with the same competition logic, even if I run it three months later, it has to be getting the same output. But can we ensure that when we are designing the data pipeline during the testing phase? So when we will consider how to actually design whether we can get it in the reproducible manner, we need to consider what are the dependencies of the output in the data pipeline design. So when we look at the data pipeline, the main dependencies are the data source as well as the computation logic. And so those two, those two dependencies are the ones that we have to manage to determine whether whatever pipeline that we're designing is reproducible before we move into production. And so the challenge is that given the same data source, how do we ensure that we replicate the same result every time we rerun the same process? Because if we have the same data source and we have the same computation logic, we need to ensure that there is no random factor that will affect whatever result they get. Because of, let's say if it's for compliance reasons, we need to ensure that whatever, whatever output that we have has to be the same every time we run the same pipeline. And so now, now that we have gone through the testing and we ensured everything's fine, so we, need, so we deploy the pipeline to production. But, how, but we also need to ensure that whatever we develop is also reproducible in production. And when we are going to a scale, right, whereby we start deploying this pipeline to into more nodes for more transactions. So let's say we would like to compute the margins for the sales transactions. So typically, each transaction will be associated with a certain cost of put sold and a certain margin. And because they are depend because they are they are reliant on the transaction itself, row by row. So we can chunk them, we compute the margins across multiple nodes, and then we collect the results into an output. So this is what we so typically if we typically if we have a process that is 
suitable for parallelism and easily parallelizable, parallelizable, then it shouldn't be much of a problem. But what if we have this particular scenario whereby we have a state source, which is probably going to keep changing state after, e after each process is complete, such as if we are trying to perform transaction requests, and we need to check whether there's enough balance in the inventory. And in this case, whether you have enough balance in the inventory for each transaction depends on the order in which the transactions are being processed. And so this is time dependent. And if you want to be able to replicate the result, then the question is that what is the current state of the data source? Because if what the, if the current state of the data source is time dependent and it keeps changing, then it poses some challenges in terms of debugging, debugging at runtime due to the shared states when you're running parallel and concurrent code. And so the challenge is that how do we design data pipelines that run the same computation logic across multiple nodes and reproduce predictable results every time? Because, because we need to be able to ensure that in order for it to be reliable, and reproducible in production. And now, now that I've actually talked about reproducibility, and now, next up, I'll talk about maintainability during debugging. Because once you have deployed your, your pipeline in production, something might happen. Because when whatever that works in testing might actually break the production. Because when we are design, because when we are designing a test when developing a data pipeline, there might be certain edge cases and inefficiencies that are not accounted for or not detected in the test cases, which actually shows up and causing performance issues or failures in production. Because well, first, typically when we design our test cases, they will be on a smaller data set and we, and we might not be able to cover every single edge case of the data that we have in production. And to complicate things further, there are, there are certain complexities in debugging and logging for parallelism because we will need to keep track of, because if we want to do logging on different clusters, then we also need to know which, like, which processes, which process in which, plus, which cluster is having some issues. And it can get really complicated when you are actually running the process. So the challenge is that how do we maintain design data pipelines that are readable and maintainable at its core to reduce inefficiencies in production, debugging, and scale. Because we can't count on our, we can't count on debugging as we go in the, in the production system. So we need to ensure that what that if there is any issue that surfaces, we should be able to identify what are what is the bug in the core in the code that is causing those issues. And when and as we add new features to an evolving growing code base because of changing business logic. The code reasoning actually becomes more challenging with increasing code complexity. And when you add new members who are new to the code base, and you add even more new features that have certain dependencies, there also runs the risk of introducing unintended behavior due to those dependencies. So the challenge that we have when adding new features in terms of maintainability is, how do we design data pipelines that adapts well to changing business and technical requirements and ensures developer productivity. And how do we do that? And this brings me to the concept of designing data pipelines as functions. And, also the, and this also brings us to the topic of functional programming. So what is functional programming? It is actually a declarative style of programming that emphasizes writing software using only pure functions and immutable values. And so for that, I will actually elaborate a little bit more on the definition. And, and the three key principles of functional programming is that we need to have, we, need, we design using pure functions and we try to avoid side effects. Secondly, immutability is a core principle. And last but not least, to for functional programming to be able to work, we need to ensure referential transparency. And what do we, how do we define a pure function? So a pure function is where the output depends on number one, input, number two, internal algorithm, and pretty much nothing else. And secondly, it must have no side effects. So it should not be influencing anything outside of the function itself. And then the implication of the concept of a pure function is that if we have the same function, we have the same input parameter, we have the same internal algorithm, 
we should be expecting the same result regardless of the number of invocations. And now that I've mentioned about pure functions as side effects, let's illustrate the concept of pure function with an example. Let's say we like to make pizza. And so for pizza, we have our ingredients. Of course, we also have pineapples because I love pineapples. We put all of them together into a nice unbaked pizza. We put it in an oven, so the oven is your function. And we set certain parameters at 160 degrees Celsius at 10 minutes, and we should be expecting a nice toasted pizza. And so this is what we expect as a pure function. In reality, making pizza is an impure function because it causes side effects. So some of the side effects will include radiation heat immunity, like from the oven. And so that's it. So you're actually affecting something in the environment and it's not in, within the oven itself. Or another side effect could be that your oven overheats and ends up changing your parameter from 160 degrees Celsius to 180 degrees Celsius. And you end up with a burnt pizza. And this is not pizza, you see. And if we look at a more formal definition in the context of, of designing a pipeline, a function with side effects changes state outside of the function, lo local function scope, which is the oven. So some examples that are common could be well, modifying a variable, or it could be local or global state. It could be performing an IO operation whereby you're reading files, or it could also be throwing an exception with an error, such as having a burnt pizza. Yes, now, we've now that I've talked about pure function, we should go into the concept of immutability. So the concept of immutability is that once I instantiate a variable and I assign a value to the variable, I cannot assign another, I, I cannot reassign another, another value to that, that particular variable. And the, and the implication of the cause of having immutability of an assigned variable is that it enforces a certain level of discipline state management and prevents side effects resulting from state change which links, uh, which enables us to design our data pipelines using pure functions. The key implication of the concept of immutability is that it makes writing parallel and concurrent programs much easier because now that I know that my data source is not going to change and I can't change it, so I, it, so I don't need to keep tracking the state of my, of my input and I can focus on partitioning my input and focusing on the computation, knowing that my, my data source is not going to change during the process. And last but not least, we talk about trans respiratory transparency. So respiratory transparency is such that if I have an expression and then I have a result and they are, pre they are pretty much, so I can actually substitute the expression with the result. So the formal definition of referential transparency is that a function is referentially transparent when an expression can be substituted by this equivalent algorithm without affecting the program logic for all programs. So, so for the example of substituting the a square function with x sub x, it's pretty much equivalent. And the conditions for referential transparency would be about the pure function, besides the pure function, it also has to be deterministic, such that the expression always returns the same output given the same input. And so let's look at this illustration for uh, well, what uh, we mean by deterministic versus non-deterministic. So for a deterministic process, let's say I would like to make breakfast, I like to make toast. So I should be expecting that for every time I want to make toast, I put bread in the oven, I should be getting toast regardless of when I make the toast. However, a non-deterministic process is such that maybe one, three months later, I try to make toast with bread, and somehow I end up with burnt toast, which is not equal to toast. And this means that the oven, the oven process, it's non-deterministic and dependent on time. And now, uh, after, now we have pure function, we have deterministic, and last but not least, there's also the concept of idiopotency, such that the expression can be applied multiple times without changing the result beyond its initial application. So once I run the pipeline once, the second time, third time, fourth time, hundredth time, it should not be changing the results. And uh, an, an example of idiopotence can be, can, will be uh, absolute function, whereby I apply, when I apply an absolute function to a negative number, if I keep applying the result, I should still get a positive number. And, and the key consequence of referential transparency that is that the expression can be replaced with this equivalent result. So in this case, 
I in this case I can I can actually reason it much easier because I can I can equate I can equate the square function with the x of x whether I have other elements in the in the in the pipeline. Now that we talk about functional programming and the concept and the principles, let's go to functional control flow. And so um, how we design functional control flow is through functional composition. So I can like, compose my functions and I, such that the output of a function can be the input of another function. And, and, and I can, and it is equi it's still equivalent. It can be equivalent to another function. And in Python, functions are first class objects such that a function can be assigned to a variable, passed as a parameter to other functions, and return as a value from other functions. And this is actually and this is actually important when we are talking about writing functional data pipelines. Because the key consequence of first class functions is that we can write higher order functions such that we can accept functions as parameters and return a function as value, which is what we are using, we're trying to do for function composition. And, and, and a related concept is anonymous functions, also known as lambda expressions in Python, such that, it state, such, that, that such that for simpler expressions, we can use a function as input without defining the name function object. Hence, we can save a bit of space in terms of creating the function, and we can use the fu function as it is as a lambda expression. And some examples of, uh, of uh, such high order functions are map, Whereby I map whereby I map each element in the collection with a function. We have a filter whereby we have a predicate which is a, which has a true false motif, and then whatever that fulfills the predicate will be will be actually selected from those collection. And last but not least, we also have reduce whereby we actually compose all the all the all the elements of the collection into a single output. And, and when we compare the use of map to the reduce versus for loop, one, one thing that we can notice is that for, for for loop, we need to manage state change of a mutable variable. Well, that is not the case for um for using for the use of map filter reduce. And a related concept of function composition is the recursion, because recursion is effectively a form of self-referential function composition because it takes the result of itself as input into another instance of itself. And we can also co consider it as a form of functional iteration. However, we can't keep going on forever. So to prevent the infinite recursive loop, a uh, base case is required as a terminating condition. And this is, a, this is an illustration of what is the difference between a recursive call stack and an iterative call stack. And as you can see, for recursive call stack, it ends up taking up much more space compared with an iterative call stack, with, whereby even though you do not have a, even though you, even so, because for recursive call stack, we are assuming that they are, we, are, we are actually calling and calling and calling, and we are actually ending up having a call a stack based on the number of calls that we make. But for the iterative call stack, we only have one stack because we are, we are changing, the, we are constantly changing the value throughout the for loop. And, and, to, and to resolve this, we have the concept of tail call optimization, which aims to reduce that frame composition consumption in the call stack. But what the tail call does is basically when it sees a pattern, and then it and then it identifies that and compiles them to iterative loop so that so that whatever so that the tail call does nothing other than just returning the value of the function call. Hence, you do not end up with a with a very high stack frame when you are doing a recursion. So something like this. So we have, when I see the pattern, I just compile it as an iterative loop in the compiler. And that is the case for some programming languages such as Scala and maybe like other, maybe Haskell and other functional programming languages. And now that I've actually talked a bit more about those, those concepts of how do we actually do the iteration and how control flow, let's go on to the, the functional design patterns for the data pipeline design. And when, we, and when I mentioned about immutability, we need to use the topic of immutable data structures. Such because, uh, so because an immutable data structure is such that once it is created, it cannot be changed. And the benefits are numerous. It is easier to reason because what you see is what you get. It is easier to test because I don't need to worry so much about the state changes. I can focus on the logic when I'm designing the pipeline. And last but not least, the main benefit is that it is thread safe and it is easier for parallelism. In some, some of the examples of data immutable data structures in Python, uh, uh, let's say the tuple. So in the case of this, I can change the I can I can change 
the I can change the element in the in the collection. But that's not the case for tuple. If you want, instead of instantiating your class to define a certain a certain data type or a dictionary, which are mutable, why not consider using a name tuple such that you cannot set and cannot reset an attribute after you have instantiated an instance of a name tuple? Well, technically, if you try to, you could use an underscore replace, but you realize that what this function actually does is creating a new instance of that of a point of how name tuple instead of replacing the original point name tuple. And now I talk about data structures. Let's talk about the algorithms and data transformations and how and we can use map filter in data transformation such as so, so we can filter the number and then we do our mapping of mapping to mapping of a collection to a certain function. And using map filter as derivatives in data transformation allows us to keep the data and transformation logic separate. And because it ensures us, it ensures that we can reuse the function that we are actually using the map filter, it improves code reusability. And we also have better transparency of the transformation logic because if we look at we, we can look clearly based on the function itself that we are mapping each of the element in, of the in the collection using a function to an output. And we can extend this concept of map filter to parallel and concurrent programming. And you can use multiprocessing. You can also use uh, uh, concurrent futures. So this, this is actually uh, something that's, uh, that's from another talk. Okay, so we can, also do, we can also perform some data actions and aggregations. So for example, reduce. So, okay, reduce is not a, it's not a building function, but it but this is still important for completeness. So we so what reduce does is that if I have a, I have a function that I will compose with an iterable, what I do is that I compose those values bit by bit. So it's sort of you know folding and folding and folding and folding until you have a single result. And using reduce and zero in data actions and aggregations ensures that when we design our data pipelines, we focus on the transformations first, which is a map filter, and that before we do our aggregation, we start actions. And the transformation logic can be, so why, we, why is it so? Because we know that the transformation logic can be applied to each element of partition, while the actions or aggregations consolidates, consolidates results from partitions through composing those results. And now that I've talked about, like, about transformations and actions, then I, and I will have to talk about Apache Spark, which uses resilient distributed data sets as a low level data abstraction. And this is related to functional programming because the RDDs are immutable and read only. And, they, and, beca and because of that, and this, and this is a very important consideration in terms of designing fault tolerant parallel operations. Because you have immutability, you also have logical partitioning. And so this makes this, and this is the and this is the main abstraction behind Apache Spark and why we can run parallel operations with that. And so, uh, so similarly, we have transformations. In uh, quick, uh, 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 five minute mark, uh, five minutes left, by the way, quick reminder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so we have learned about transformations in Apache Spark. We have a data set which we transformed into a new data set or RDD. And for actions, we learned that a data set or RDD is transformed into an, a non RDD result. So, this is actually similar to what I've actually mentioned about transformations versus actions. For that, and in relation to map filter and reduce. And since we are at Python 3.10 now, I right, have to mention a bit about structural pattern matching, which is inspired by similar syntax to Scala. And this is especially useful for conditional matching of data structure patterns. So um, this so it's pretty, pretty simple. You have a match, uh, you match an item, and you look through all those cases, and it matches a, 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 a certain case, you do something. And this is some, this is uh, this is particularly useful if you want to be replacing certain matching in terms of data types, whether it's an instance of a certain data type. So before Python three point ten, we have to rely on if and if and else. And now with Python three point ten, we if you look at the code on the left, it looks pretty much more straightforward because we are matching the structure of the data. And this and and this. And the implication of using structural pattern matching is that it ensures it enables us to maintain the data schema in a cleaner manner. 
And so, for example, right, we are, for example, we are using case, uh, data class, which is similar to case classes in Scala. And so you can see that, so you can see clearly that we have those two data class types and I'm matching based on which type it belongs to. It is in terms of the structure. And to complete this talk, um, we also need to mention a little bit about type systems because Python, although it does not, it, it doesn't have static type, it does not, it's not, does not have strict typing, it does have support for type hints, although it's not enforced in runtime. And, and how we can enforce that is through type checking with MyPy, and which can be used in, in together with your type hints. So you can see that if the types are wrong, you're going to show up a type error, and this ensures your type checking. And why is it so important to enforce certain type checking in when developing your data pipeline? It's because it prevents bugs at runtime by ensuring type safety and consistency across the data, data pipeline. Because we want to be very sure, we want to be very transparent about the data type. We want to be very transparent about the data, and we want to be able to design a data pipeline such that it it and it actually considers all those factors in consideration, especially at scale. So now that I've actually talked about all the data, all the data patterns, can we write a purely functional data pipeline in Python? So short answer is not really, because we need to consider that we still have to have, we still need IO operations for reading and writing data outside of the application domain. And so this brings me to another design pattern called functional core imperative shell, which is inspired, which is based on Gary Berhardt's pipe on 2030 talks on boundaries. So the idea is that you keep the we keep the core domain transformation logic as a functional core, and then we leave the infrastructure code separate from this functional core so that we can interface with our data. And an example of, the, of using functional core in imperative shell can be shown in this example. So we have the IO layer to read the data. We have the functional layer for the computation logic. And lastly, we end off this program with an IO layer to write the data outside of the program. And so the key takeaways for this talk is that like, when we are designing data pipelines at scale, it is advisable to adopt functional design patterns for especially when especially when we are looking at parallel and distributed workflows, because we need to consider that when we are designing at scale, it needs to be reproducible, scalable, and maintainable. And while we can't design an entire purely functional program, we can adopt a functional core imperative shell design pattern to manage side effects separately from the data pipeline logic. And that's the end of my talk. We hope to re do reach out to me via the following channels. And I'm currently writing a, an algorithm series on functional programming. So do check it out. Thank you.